This is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, where we take a look at people who have died recently who have had a profound effect on history or culture. And tonight we're going to start out with Gil Scott Heron. Gil Scott Heron died recently at the age of 62, and he was an African-American bluesologist, as he liked to call himself. He was actually a one-hit wonder, but he was unusual in the fact that his hit wasn't really a popular hit, but what it did was it spawned one of the iconic phrases of the 20th century. Let's get some background on Gil Scott Heron. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, right here in Chicago, Illinois. His father was a soccer player. and father, His father was the first black soccer player for one of the Glasgow soccer teams. And his mother and he divorced when Gil was very young. Gil was sent down to Tennessee to live with his grandmother. And he suffered the racism and the segregation attitudes of the South back in the 50s and early 60s. And here he talks a little bit about it. They would say, you know, this is Bob Scott's boy. They would just skip over Gil, you mm-hmm. know, and they would describe me in Tennessee. They would say, you know, it's Bob Scott's boy. Whatever, whatever you want to do is I. The, the, the reputation that my grandfather had he, 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 many years after his death because of what he had meant in the community. And uh, I got to know him and what that was all about through the way they treated me because I was kin to him and I was Bob Scott's boy. They still looked at my grandmother as a contact, as a touch to me with a certain amount of respect that had been intended initially for him, that had been given him. They still carried a lot of weight in the black community in Tennessee. And I, I, I do this song about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer who was also a diminutive force of nature uh, oh, in nice Mississippi. Thing, in Mississippi. Small, dark, stout. My grandmother was small, light-skinned, thin-boned, uh, but very well-respected and uh, very much uh, forces in the community in terms of like asking people to, to, to continue to do the right thing and to continue to stand where they had been standing that that was going to be all right. There was nothing wrong with standing up for what you believed in. And that there was something very wrong in not standing up for what you believed in. You had to move as a community in them days, because they picked y'all one by one. We were still being lynched in, 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 in Tennessee, Mississippi at the time. Emmett Till, Mac Parker, all those were still being mistreated and mistreated to the maximum. Uh, your life being taken. So you needed to have someone to remind you that, that, that as if we were like this, we all right. If we stand this way, they could break the fingers. This was the, the image that, that was used. When he was a teenager, Gil and his mother moved to Harlem, where he experienced a different kind of segregation racism attitudes, the racism and segregation of the North. He went to DeWitt Clinton High School, a very well-known high school in the Bronx. When he graduated, he went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Lincoln University is a traditionally black college. It's where Langston Hughes went. And he met a friend there, and they turned their interest to music. And when he was 21 years old, he recorded this number. It's a tone poem with a lot of contemporary references, and many people believe it to be the forerunner of rap. In fact, in some corners, he's known as the godfather of rap. The number is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Take a listen. be able to stay home brother you will not be able to plug in turn on and cop out you will not be able to lose yourself on skag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised the revolution will not be televised that's what gil scott heron was known for at the age of 21 and like so many one-hit artists he never duplicated that success again He did work for another 10 to 15 years, and you can tell in that song the influence that he had on both rap and hip-hop later on. Even though he professed not to like rap or hip-hop, he preferred jazz. Even though he preached ardently against drugs, by the way, the reference to skag early in the revolution will not be televised as to heroin, he did develop a cocaine problem later in his life, and like so many one-hit artists, it was drugs that derailed his career. But he mellowed very much in his later years, and he became a philosopher. And here he talks a little bit about his philosophy of self-help, considerably lower-key attitude. You can't never tell nobody 
else. If you didn't get no breakers, you black. Get on there. You're always going to be black. But whatever excuse people carry around with them is generally something I'm like, I never had a chance. All right, but now you got one. You can't say that no more. You know, all we want people to do is to accomplish something as opposed to criticizing the people who didn't get to do that for you yet. You can, you just complain about what they didn't do yet. Okay, so that always give you a position to complain with. There'll always be something you can find that has not been done yet. What we're saying is either contribute or shut up. If somebody comes to you and asks for help, and you can help them, you're supposed to help them. Why wouldn't you? You have been put in the position somehow to be able to help this person. And something within them, because it takes a lot for a person to come and ask you, anybody, to, to, to loan them something, to, 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 to help them because they need this. They have broken themselves all the way down to the point where they will come and do that. You're supposed to do that. And you're supposed to do it as painlessly as possible. You will be helped in your soul by doing it. Your soul needs help. And this is something you can do a little bit of something every day to help your insides. You see, like, 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 like your, your insides are more important if you can understand it because they support everything that you radiate towards. Everybody that you come in contact with can feel that. I'm saying like people who spend a lot of time looking in the mirror, they know how they look, sort of. But the way you know how you look really is in the expressions on other people's faces when you say something. And how you look is on the expressions of these other people's faces, on the, on the smile they give you when you play a song for them or you, you, you give them an idea that they can go do something with you. Not exactly the angry young black man that was portrayed in most of the obituaries. These, these, these are gifts. These are things that you've been given. And you're not supposed to keep them to yourself. You're supposed to share them. From the Indians who welcome the pilgrim to the buffalo who once rode the plain. Like the vultures circling beneath the dark clouds looking for the rain. David looking for the rain. As I mentioned before, Gil Scott Heron had a bad drug problem before he died, and despite this, I don't think the obituaries concentrated enough how he changed as a person throughout his life. He went from the terrible experiences he had as a youth to the black protest culture that was so prevalent in the 60s and 70s to his maturation and his concentration on the contributions of the black community to the rest of society. And I don't think he was given adequate credit for that. So we thank you very much, Gil Heron, for everything you've done. Used to say, you know, one L, two T's, and no I. That's how you spell Gil and Scott and Heron. We're going to move on now to Dr. Rosalind Yellow. And Dr. Rosalind Yellow was one of the giants of 20th century endocrinology. She was the second woman to win a Nobel Prize in medicine. She was the first American woman to win the Nobel Prize in medicine. She won it for her work in endocrinology. She was the co-discoverer of what we call the radioimmune assay, which was a way to measure hormone levels in the blood, hormones like thyroid hormone and growth hormone. And this was literally revolutionized the field of endocrinology. She suffered a lot of discrimination early in her career for being a woman and for being Jewish, but she rose above that. And here is Scope TV talking a little bit about Dr. Rosalind Yellow. She comes from New York. She's Jewish, and she's a woman. These were the terse reasons given by Purdue University to refuse admission in 1941 to Rosalind Sussman, which was Yellow's maiden name. If she hadn't fought such blatant discrimination, the life of this brave woman 78 years old would have been much different. Among other things, she wouldn't have been a Nobel laureate in medicine in 1977. We studied physics in Hunter, which was a girls' school when I was there, and then in graduate school at the University of Illinois, I was the first woman that one can remember, but the war was about to 
free arm and, and as a result, there were opportunities for women in science. After receiving her PhD in nuclear physics in 1945 from the University of Illinois, Rosalind returned to New York to work at the Veterans Hospital. There, she met Dr. Solomon Burson, who became her devoted working partner for over 20 years. We both were working at the VA, and the head of medicine at the VA suggested that Saul and I talk to each other because he felt we would work well together. And that's how it started. Together, they developed a technique called radioimmunoassay using isotopes designed to identify rare substances in the human body's fluids. This technique uses radiation in a safe manner, thus paving the way for a more accurate diagnosis of illnesses caused by imbalances in the hormonal system. They demonstrated, for example, that diabetics didn't always suffer from a lack of insulin in the blood. Quite often, there were other unknown factors that blocked the hormones. Later, a research team used Dr. Yellow's techniques to test donors' blood for hepatitis, to correct the hormonal level in couples with infertility problems, and to treat children with stunted growth. All in all, this discovery revolutionized endocrinology, which is the study of hormone action, and rewarded Rosalind Yellow with the Nobel Prize. Her marriage in 1943 to Aaron Yellow a physics major are just as important to her as her career and the accolades she has received. And of course, there's the problem of being married and having children. I think it's important for women to have children and do research, which sometimes makes it very difficult. Rosalind is one of only six women Nobel laureates in medicine. In 1977, she suffered a stroke, but recovered to happily continue her worthy medical research. It's an unbelievable experience to learn that you're going to get a Nobel Prize. The great tragedy was that Saul Burson had died, or he would have shared it with me. As you can tell, Rosalind Yellow was not only brilliant, but she was a kind and generous woman, and she had a sort of an elfish sense of humor about her, when she was giving her Nobel lecture, she included one of the rejection letters from one of the scientific journals for one of her landmark papers. Having had my share of scientific papers rejected, trust me, that's something you really dream of doing. I'll never get a chance to do it in front of the Nobel Committee, though. Finally, we're going to close tonight by noting the death of Randy Macho Man Savage. And Randy Macho Man Savage was a professional wrestler. He died in an auto accident at the age of 58 recently. He was originally from Downers Grove, Illinois, right here in the Chicagoland area. And after a semi-professional baseball career, he became a professional wrestler and was a champion with the WWE and the WWF. And I don't even really understand all that stuff. And I'm not exactly sure I understand the appeal of the theatrics of professional wrestling. But Randy Macho Man Savage was one of the superstars of professional wrestling reason I'm closing with him, of course, is because he gives us a chance to do a good closing song. So, my thanks to Sid Tepps, my producer, and we're going to close tonight with a brief tribute to Randy Macho Man Savage with who else but the village people. <laughs>